How angry are you? Let's be honest, most of us are pretty angry throughout our week. Angry in traffic, angry with our families, our coworkers, our neighbors. Anger comes everywhere. But is it a sin? And how do we deal with it? Let's talk about it today. Hey, thank you for joining us today, whether you are in person or watching with us online. If you are new today and I did not get the chance to meet you, I would love to meet you. And I will be standing at our tent outside um, and you can swing by. It's only like 110 right now and there's a slight amount of shade, so you can just give a quick hi uh, before you go. But we are glad that you are here today because we are continuing on in our series, Seven Things, and we're winding down to the final two which I I consider this an accomplishment because I haven't been yelled at or fired or been mad about preaching sin each week um, in some tough subjects. We're in the home stretch, so it gets a little bit better here. But today we turn our attention to wrath or anger. And wrath is really just an intense way to say anger. And, you know, as we kind of get into this one, this is, a, this is a hard one to preach and talk about because it's so widely spread. You see, you don't have to teach someone to be angry. You don't have to emulate it. This past week, as I was preparing for the sermon, and then I went home, and usually my kids are always so excited to see me. It's nice. Um, I could get rid of my dog because, you know, I had kids to greet me at the door, so it was nice. Um, but they're so excited. They're like, Daddy, blah, blah, And, you know, gave them hugs and whatever, and then they went to playing. My three-year-old son playing with my almost five-year-old daughter, and they're playing for a little bit, and then all of a sudden she takes a toy he wants, and I watch his face. He grits his teeth, his eyes get wide, and he's just like, like he's about to pounce, like attack, like a wild animal. Like, I'm just like, oh my goodness, like someone grabbed the kid and like got to jump in like, but I was like, I didn't teach him that. When I get angry, I don't grit my teeth. I don't even get my eyes wide, maybe a little bit. I have glasses, you can't tell as much. But I'm like, anger comes naturally for all of us. And today, as we talk about this, whether we are children or adults, that anger is something we all share in. And as we kind of dive into this, this topic today, we need to see that the Bible has a lot to say about anger. In Matthew chapter 5, 22, Jesus starts and he says this, he says, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus tells us right off the bat that our anger has consequences. Our anger eventually leads to judgment when when it's uncontrolled, when it's unchecked. Psalm 37, 8 says, refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. David tells us that we need to give it up because eventually if, if anger is harnessed to us, it will only lead to hurt. That good will not come from storing up anger, from throwing our anger out. It will only harm other people. Proverbs 14, 29 says, a patient person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. Solomon tells us how childish and how stupid our anger is, that we look like a fool. We look like we're, we don't know what we're doing. But then Ephesians 4, 26 says, be angry and do not sin. You see, Paul adds a complexity to this. Paul tells us that anger doesn't automatically equal sin. James gives a little bit more expansion on James 1.19. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And he listens, he says, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. You see, James tells us that there's a human anger, a fleshly anger, a sinful anger that doesn't do anything good for God. And then Numbers 32, 13 says, So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until the entire generation of those who had done evil in the sight of the Lord was destroyed. You see, I wrap up these verses with Moses recording that God is angry with his people when they don't follow his will for them. You see, anger is a really complex subject. It's not enough to say, hey, be angry and don't sin, right? Like, it actually says that in the Bible, but Paul keeps talking after that. We can say, hey, control your anger, don't do this, whatever, but there's more nuances, there's more depths to this that we need to explore today. So as we kind of start this off, I want to give you a key thought as we kind of go into our scripture, and we're going to study this um, today, is that sinful anger leads to spiritual blindness. That when we are angry, 
not in a righteous way, which we're going to define those and see how they're different, but when we are sinfully anger, it leads us to not spiritually be able to see what God has in front of us. And you see, as we kind of get into our story today, we're going to see how anger is so different. Anger is different from every other sin that we've studied in this series. So far, we've hit pride, lust, greed, envy, gluttony, and next week, we're going to hit sloth. And, and you see, all these are different because all these, in just the basic sense of these things, are sinful. You can't have a righteous envy. You can't have a righteous pride or a glorious lust. Like, those things are in themselves bad, but anger is simply an emotion, it's an emotion that can lead to something good, but often it's just an emotion that leads to something bad. And you see, if this anger that we talk about, we're going to see kind of how this plays out, not only our own anger, but what God's righteous anger looks like. So if you have a Bible with me, go ahead and flip to Numbers chapter 22. If you need a Bible, you can grab the one in the chair in front of you, and Numbers is the fourth book of the Bible. It's very early on, but in Numbers 22, we're going to be starting this in verse 21. Um, you can also f- find all these notes on the YouVersion Bible app. But we're going to come to a very obscure story. And you're gonna see why it's very obscure in just a few minutes. But it's also an awesome story that shows the different sides of anger, that shows the different ways anger kind of manifests itself, how they play out. And I believe it's the answer to the first question we need to ask is when is anger a sin? C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity and talking about anger said it this way, that one man may be so placed that his anger sheds the blood of thousands and another so placed that however angry he gets, he will only be laughed at. But he continues, he says, the little mark on the soul may be much the same in both. The bigness or the smallness of one thing seen from the outside is not what really matters. You see, sinful anger just isn't about blowing up. It's not just about yelling. It's not just about being violent or even hurting someone, but it's more of what is happening beneath the surface. What is boiling up inside of us? And too often we will judge an angry person whether we see it as a threat or we see it something we're scared of or if we're hurt by, but so often anger can take many forms. When I was a kid, um, one of my lifelong friends, Brandon, best friend growing up, he had a, he, we, we literally, he was a year younger than me, so we knew each other since we were babies and we had grown up, and we called those the golden years until his little brother was born, um, and that was Bennett. And when we were kids, you know, we were jerks, um, as children are, uh, but we used to tease Bennett a lot, and, we, and it was funny, we used to call him Ralph, and I don't know why, uh, we thought it was clever, but when we called him Ralph, that little boy's face would get so red. He would get so angry. You know what we did? We laughed so hard. Because he was just an angry little kid. He couldn't do anything to us. If he tried to come at us, we would be mean and just like, you know, beat him up or something until he went and like cried to his parents. Like, I was the youngest, so I got beat up a lot, so I don't feel that bad. Um, But it's like we would just laugh at that anger. And you see, anger sometimes, we judge it just by the external consequences of it. But as C.S. Lewis says, whether it's something that is hurting someone or something that we merely laugh off, it's really about what's happening deep in the heart. So the first way I think we see that anger becomes a sin is when it loudly throws selfish emotions externally around us. Let's start reading the story in Numbers chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 23, and we'll back up and kind of see this story in context in a minute. But it says this, verse 23. It says, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing on the path with the drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the path and went into the field. So Balaam hit her to return her to the path. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow passage between the vineyards with a stone wall on either side. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord and pressed herself against the wall, squeezing Balaam's foot against it. So he hit her once again. Verse 26, the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she crouched down under Balaam, so he became furious and he beat the donkey with his stick. Verse 28, then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth. And she asked Balaam, what have I done to you that you have beaten me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you made me look like a fool. If I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you now. But the donkey said, am I not the donkey you've ridden all your life until today? 
have I ever treated you this way? And he replied, no. So when I told you it was an obscure story, what I meant is there's a talking donkey, okay? (laughs) You guys ready for that? You're like, the Bible has a story about a talking donkey? Now, I want to adjust this a little bit because there's skeptics that they hear this like, all right, I'm with the Bible. I like the Bible. It's got great advice for my life. But then when they see crazy things like that, they're like, yeah, it's fairy tales. But let me just tell you, the whole Bible, the truth of the Bible is based on God coming down in human flesh, dying on a cross and raising again. If God can do that, he can open a donkey's mouth, all right? And in the King James, he, the donkey's actually called an ass. And I'm just saying he's, he's let them speak for a long time, for thousands of years, okay? That's all. <laughs> but I'm, shh, got that one. Um, but this is an obscure passage, but let me give you a little background here, because I think we need to see this in full context, and then we're going to see why it, it kind of runs into anger today. But a little bit of background here is this is in the time of Moses, and God had just used Moses to free his people from Egypt, and they're wandering around in the wilderness. And as they're going through, God says, I have a land I'm going to give you. So they start going towards that land. But as they do, they have to pass through other kingdoms. And they ask the kings as they're going to go through, hey, can we pass through? And the kings, one after one, say, no, no, no. So then fighting starts. War starts breaking out, and they have to defend themselves. This is hundreds of thousands of people of Israel going through this desert. And it brings us to our story today. As they're going through this, then this character is introduced named Balaam. Now, Balaam was a pagan prophet who he pretty much worked for money. If you see modern day today, he'd be like a tarot card reader. Like he's kind of predicting things for people's future, just throwing this out. This is what the universe has for you. And it's like, it will be like 1995, right? Um, And he's charging kings and people to be able to see their future, to throw blessings and curses out there. But as he kind of gets to this point, he is approached by this king, Balak. And Balak says, come to me so I can talk to you about this nation Israel that's coming up. And as he starts making his way towards King Balak on his donkey, God knows the intention of Balaam. He knows that he's trying to manipulate God, that he's trying to use him for his own resources and power, and God steps in and starts to intervene. You see, here is kind of the first thing when we talk about this, is how anger becomes sin, is when we selfishly throw our emotions externally. Here's the deal with Balaam, is he starts going against the will of God And then he begins to hit some obstacles. And when he hits those obstacles, he's not happy about it, but he's furious. He starts beating his donkey. And here's the other thing. He's so mad that he doesn't even react to the fact his donkey responded to him, right? Like he was like, oh, we've had this conversation before. It's like, but dude, your donkey's talking. Are you mad or are you like crazy? It's like he literally just saw red in that moment. But his donkey starts speaking to him and he's like so angry, he just starts beating his steed. And it's kind of modern day, like you've heard this expression before as you go home and you kick the dog. You're mad about work, you're mad about your family, you're mad about your friends, you're mad about your circumstances, and instead of actually dealing with it, we take it out on others. The dog is so happy to see you and you just like kick it, right? Or say like, get out of here, like I don't want it. And this is exactly what he's doing here, his life is going against him And he's just acting out to something he can hurt, something he can blame, something he can throw when deep down he knows it's his fault. And you see, this is why I think it's important here and why he got angry so quickly is because he knew he wasn't going the right way. He knew he was trying to manipulate God and that's why he was hitting this roadblock. And often for us, we get angry, we get mad when things don't go our way. You want an example? Is how nice of a person are you in traffic? right? Like, I'll be honest, I'm not a nice person in traffic. Just don't go talk to my wife. Like, I swerve and I get in, you know, I don't like doing anything crazy dangerous. I just drive a little fast. Um, And we have a minivan and it goes pretty quick. Like, it gets up. I'm not going (laughs) to... We actually, when we test drove it, there was paddle shifters. And I had to ask the guy, I'm like, what are these? He's like, they're paddle shifters. I'm like, dude, it's a minivan. And I'm like, but they work. Uh, Anyway, But we drive and we get angry, right? We're like, why is this person my way? Why is this person there? And like selfishly, we're thinking we don't care about what's happening in front of us because we're more important. It's getting in our way and our blood starts to boil. 
And in so many of our areas of that, that's what happens. We get frustrated with our spouse, with our job, with our neighbors, right? I get frustrated with my neighbors when they shoot off fireworks at like 10 o'clock at night and my kids are sleeping. I about drove over there the other day. And it's like we get mad and angry at things around us. And it causes us to spew out. But so often, the problem is we do that to the people we love and the people that are around us. You see, he didn't just take that out on anyone. He took that out on his donkey, who he had ridden his entire life. The donkey's like, bro, what did I do to you? Why are you doing this to me? And so often our kids and our spouses are saying the same thing. Why are you doing this to me? Haven't I been by your side through all the issues? Why is this happening here? And you see, if we are not careful, we can fall into this trap where our selfish emotives let us, lead us to explode on other people and take out our anger on them. But sin also, or anger also becomes a sin, and not only when it explodes externally, but when it quietly brews selfishly, and I would say it brews selfish emotions internally. Let's check out and back up to verse 1 of this chapter in 22, verse 1. And this gives a little background we kind of mentioned here before. But it says, The Israelites traveled on, and they camped in the plains of Moab near the Jordan across from the Jericho. Right? They're going through the wilderness. And listen to this in verse 2. Now, Balak, he's a king, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, in verse 3, Moab, who Balak oversees, was terrified of the people because they were numerous, and Moab dreaded the Israelites. You see, everyone in this story is angry. Balaam is angry at his donkey, but before he was angry at his donkey, Balak is angry at Israel. And he was so afraid of them that he then boiled up anger inside of him, and all he wanted is for them to fall. All he wanted for was them, for them to be cursed, for them to hurt. And, and that sinful anger acted out on him reaching out to Balaam and say, hey, I want to hire you to put a curse on these people. And you see, this is the sinful anger that boils up on inside that we often don't focus on. We see the external. We see when someone's a jerk. We see someone's mad. We easily recognize the guy who's yelling at the waiter at the restaurant. But then what we ignore is what's inside, and we think, man, that guy's such a jerk. I hope he gets what's coming to him. And just as C.S. Lewis says, that quiet anger, that puts a little mark on our soul. And sometimes we don't realize that the anger that is brewing inside of us is what is hurting us, and, and, and may not come out right away, but it's just brewing year after year after year. And this is what makes anger such a complex subject, because sometimes we don't even know what's happening. Anger is one of those where you sit down and you talk to someone, a counselor, you go through therapy, and as you talk, you're like, oh my goodness, I was mad at my dad for all these years. Like, oh my goodness, like it was this reason, and this is what I'm holding on to that has plagued me year after year after year after year, and we never dealt with it. And then it becomes something worse. One of the worst tragedies that we've seen on a large scale in our world consistently, it seems like, over the last 20 or so years, is terrible tragedies like school shootings. And as I was thinking about this before, it's not like those happen just in the heat of emotion. It's not like a kid one time gets something mean said to him one time and all of a sudden he freaks out, brings a gun to school and something terrible happens. Instead, it's brewing over time, over time, over time as this person is sitting there thinking they're unworthy, hearing the world just crush them down and that anger brews and brews and brews with no healthy way to get it out. And you see, and I think when we look and we read out this story and we say, when is anger bad? When is it sinful? And when it externally goes out or when it internally brews inside, what we need to ask ourselves is, is that me? Do I struggle with this? Am I kicking the dog, literally or metaphorically? Am I taking anger out on those that are around me that I love? Or, the baby agrees, or am I internalizing this? Am I hoping and scheming for bad things to happen to other people, for those who I should be ahead of? Well, let's put a time out on that, and I want to shift gears a little bit, and I want to look at the other side of this coin. And on the other side of it, we need to ask the question, well, when is anger good? Now, I have no data on this, and usually I kind of like bring in facts and like to kind of bring that all together. But one of the ways, I think when we talk about anger being good and bad, is I'm just going to throw this out there. 
I have a feeling that in our lives, in our world, most of the time, we act out of anger in the bad way, not the good way. We don't have a righteous anger. Usually, we have the bad anger that kind of comes inside. But I think we need to look at, well, what does it look like when it is good? What are the marks of that? Well, the first way is when it is done to stop sin. Back up in Numbers chapter 22, look at verse 22. And this is what kind of starts this little donkey ride journey that they, we just read about. But it starts and it says this, but God was incensed, look at that word, incensed that Balaam was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand and the path to oppose him. Balaam was riding the donkey and his two servants were with him. I told you again that everyone is angry in this story. Um, we don't get that the donkey was angry. He was kind of sad, but I have a feeling the donkey was angry too. But before the donkey was angry and Balaam was angry, God was angry. And it literally says that as this journey began, God was incensed. He was fuming. He was mad because as we alluded to earlier, he knew the intentions of Balaam's heart. And Balaam wanted to use God in order to get money, power, and fame from Balak. And God's anger led to him intervening and stopping Balaam on the road and telling him to repent. Let's keep reading in verse 31. Listen, I just I love this interaction. It says in verse 31, it says, And the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. This is when he stopped and the donkey talks to him. He opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the path with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam knelt low and bowed in worship on his face. Then the angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? Look, I came out to oppose you because I consider what you are doing to be evil. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away from me, I would have killed you by now and let her live. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned for I did not know that you were standing in the path to confront me. And now if it is evil in your sight, I will go back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but you are to only say what I tell you. You see, God opposed him because he was on an evil path. And sometimes the anger of God burning around us or the anger of brothers and sisters in the church burning around us sometimes is for our own good. And not to bring, like sometimes we just think anger is always to bring our own selfish motives forward, but rather sometimes anger is there to prevent sin in our lives. We should personally be angry about sin in our lives, but we should have other people that are angry about the sin in our lives too. Not ones that just want to judge you and, and throw stuff at you, but ones that truly want to help you move forward and that you trust that are brothers and sisters in Christ. And you see, the anger here is all about accountability. And as Christians, if we are on a path towards sin, I pray that God sends anger in your path to stop you and turn you around. Because sometimes we're like Balaam, we're spiritually blind and we almost need that kick in the face. We need something around us to wake us up and say, you're sinning against God, you're going the wrong direction, and God has something better for you. And for us, as we kind of evaluate our anger, we need to ask the question, is my anger selfish or is my anger helping to stop someone else's sin in their lives? Now, as I reflected on that, I gotta say, that is a heavy, heavy question to ask, especially for parents. How do you find that line where you need to be mad because there is sin in your child's life and you don't want them to go down a path you know is gonna wreak destruction, but at the same time, you don't wanna just be yelling at them, hammering down, and be that grumpy old mean parent that they will despise for years later. But is my anger righteous? Is it doing something to stop the sin in someone else's life? But also we need to look at and see that anger is also good when it is done to bring justice. Flip over a few chapters to Numbers chapter 24. And in Numbers 24, we're going to be picking up at verse 3. And kind of what happens from here is Balaam makes it to Balak. But because he's been approached by God, God says, only speak what I tell you to speak. And Balaam actually kind of, he listens here. And, and this is one of his, his times where he's kind of going back and forth. And this is, I think, the third time he talks to Balak. And he's saying, curse these guys, curse these guys, curse these guys. And this is the answer he gets, starting in verse 3. He says, he proclaimed his poem. 
The oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eyes are opened, the oracle of the one who hears the sayings of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls into a trance with his eyes uncovered. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwellings, Israel. They stretch out like river valleys, like a garden beside a stream, like aloes the Lord has planted, like cedars beside the water. Water will flow from his bucket, and his seed will be abundant by, be by abundant water. His king will be greater than Agog. His kingdom will be exalted. This is what Balaam is saying on behalf of God about Israel. Verse 8, God brought him out of Egypt. He is like the horns of a wild ox for them. He will feed on enemy nations and not on their bones. He will strike them with his arrows. He crouches, he lies down like a lion or a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? And this is the money verse right here. Those who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed. Here's what happened there. The king goes to Balaam and said, I want you to curse them. And God's like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to sit by and let my people be hurt. God wasn't going to sit by and let injustice happening. Because a little background here, Israel had actually approached all these nations. They said, hey, can we pass through your land? They're like, we won't touch anything. We won't touch your water. We won't touch your food. We won't touch your people, your possessions. We're just going to pass through. God's providing food from heaven. It's fantastic. And they're like, we just want to walk through and get to our land that we're promised. But king after king said, no, we're going to stop you. We're going to fight you. And when that injustice rose up against God's people, God's like, no, 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 I'm not going to let that happen. And God's anger burned against these other nations because they were hurting his people, because they were trying to kill his people. And today for us, what that tells us is we should be upset when injustices happen in our worlds. And just read the news. There are so many injustices happening. Injustices from sex trafficking to racial inequality, to the neglect of the poor, or the murder of the unborn. And the list goes on and on and on. And this is a whole nother sermon that I don't have time to get into. But here's what I'm going to leave you. Is when we talk about injustice in our world, is we need to find those through the lens of God's word and through, his, his, and through the Bible, rather through the lens of our culture. It's so often we're really mad about things that are happening in our world because our world tells us to be mad about. And then we look in God's word and we're like, well, maybe I shouldn't be taking a stand on that. Maybe I don't have to make a, tw you know, a tweet about that and everyone know I'm on the right side of history. It's like, maybe I need to stand on the word of God and speak up for what he says is right and wrong. And when those injustices happen, then our God is vindicated and our anger should burn against that evil. But here's the deal. Whether anger is good or whether his anger is bad, we need to ask, how do we not fall into the wrong side? Because again, too often, I think, if we're being honest, we're, we're really not struggling with a good anger. We're struggling with the bad anger, the anger that comes when we don't want it, or the anger that just our flesh just takes hold of us. So how do we prevent anger from blinding us? How do we prevent this from just taking control? Well, I think it's not, again, when we get into this, it's not the question of if anger will come, but why. And I think we need to ask, are we angry for good reasons or are we angry for bad? So I want to wrap this up today, and when we talk about opening our eyes and not seeing red, not being spiritually blinded to what's happening around us, I want to give two practical ways of how do we prevent this anger from boiling into sin in our lives. And the first is this, we need to lower our expectations of the world. Romans 6.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay? We live in a broken, sinful, messed up world. And I think we get angry so many times because life doesn't meet our expectations. Many of you know I'm an avid sports fan, and I'm an Arizona native, so I root for all my teams. Um, and one of the hard things is, like, I always have high expectations. Like, every year I think the Cardinals are going to win the Super Bowl. Um, and let me just tell you, I've been disappointed every single year. But this year, something different happened. One, my expectations were not for the Suns to get to the finals. And two, my expectations for the Diamondbacks were so unbelievably low. And guess what? They're one of the worst teams in baseball history, like ever, like so bad. It's not even terrible. But you know what? I haven't been mad about one single game because my expectations were already that they'd be terrible, okay? So when they were terrible, I'm like, 
yeah, they're terrible. That's right. Like me and Wes haven't talked about the Diamondbacks once. Now the Suns finals run helped that. But you get my point. Like sometimes we have these unrealistic expectations of our world and of our lives, and then when we don't achieve them, we just burn with anger. And the hypocrisy is that we have those expectations of others and how our life should go, but then we usually don't have that same, for that same expectation for ourselves. So we get mad when people aren't perfect. We get mad when that dude cuts us off on traffic or our kid isn't like a perfect little child and doesn't listen all the time or our spouse doesn't meet our every need or our, our, our idea of what we thought we were getting into with marriage and we get angry about these unrealistic, ridiculous expectations when the Bible tells us we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. We need to have realistic expectations of our world. Now, you need, you need to not stop there. Because if I leave you just with that, you're just going to be depressed. You're going to be hopeless. You're like, our world sucks, whatever. Just let it burn. I don't care. (laughs) It's not going to get better. But I think there's a caveat and there's a part two of that is we need to hire our expectations of forgiveness. You, you You know what makes anger go away so easily? Forgiveness. Because so often... We are so angry because we are harnessing something in our heart that shouldn't be there. You want a great example of this? God forgave us so we don't have to suffer the wrath of his anger. That we deserve his anger. We deserve all to have a pillar of fire come down from heaven and burn us all up for our sinful lives. And that's what we deserve apart from God. But he set aside his anger and he offered his son. Ephesians 4, 32 says, And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. You see, that's what the gospel is all about. That we're imperfect. That our lives are just as messed up as the rest of the world's lives. That we make mistakes. We hurt people. We get angry when we shouldn't get angry. We act out when we shouldn't act. And we deserve an eternal punishment in hell. But he sent his son, Jesus Christ, here for us to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, and to raise from that grave so that we could have the grace of a God we do not deserve. And when we live in the light of that forgiveness and that grace, it allows us to extend that forgiveness and grace to others. So here's what I want to leave you with and ask you today. Are you going to be guided by the sin of your anger? Are you going to live in the freedom and the light of God's grace? Let's pray.